Hello everybody. And this is the second to last class. And I'm pretty much looking forward to it. Like kind of feel like I need this class. So let's get started with it. It's gonna be about Bhakti. Almost kind of to the end of everything. There's only one more left after this. All right. So to recap what we've yeah. anyway to recap what we've done so far, we started out with that famous thing. Now, Advaitam Gyana is Tattva. Vedanti tat tattva vidas tattva jnanam advayam prameti paramatmeti bhagavanati shabdate. The reality or tattva is based on jnana. Tattva is based on jnana. <coughs> Even if you mistranslate that, it's an interesting thing. Uh, tattva is often mistranslated as truth, and we're not mistranslated, but like kind of shallowly translated as truth. And Ganam is often shallowly translated as knowledge, so it's pretty interesting to say truth is based on knowledge as well. Um, reality is based on consciousness, perception, and this consciousness is a special type of consciousness which is not different from the reality that it produces, or it's not different from anything that it produces. It's all inclusive consciousness. This is consciousness is not. The consciousness is not being conscious of some reality which is separate from it. It's being consciousness of the reality which is itself. So it's called Advayam or unseconded. And comprehension of that Advayam Jnana is, is to three extents Brahmeti, what well, can be called Brahman or just perception of it as awareness itself. Awareness of awareness and that's it. Then is Paramatmeti, which is awareness residing in a subject and acting upon an object, and specifically residing in the supreme subject and acting upon the objects. And Bhagavaniti is comprehending why consciousness resides in the subject and acts upon an object's object so it can enjoy itself. So there's the first five classes. Reality is a component of and produced by consciousness. And ultimately, it's for the sake of consciousness to enjoy itself by experiencing itself. The problem in the monistic theory is that something unfortunate happens to Brahman. That's the problem. That's the difficult thing for them to explain is how could something unfortunate happen to something which is a perfect and all-powerful so what what they say is unfortunate is that somehow ignorance affected it or illusion affected it and therefore it's changed its condition from something from something that's naturally blissful and peaceful into something that's always stressed out and needy so that's the flaw in their situation is that Brahman became divided into many different things, unfortunately. And the way that you can get this to agree with, with the Bhagavatam's conception, which is Vyasa's conception, is just to say that it's not unfortunate. It's intentional. That and, and now we won't speak of only Brahman, but we'll speak of Bhagavan as the full full conception of Brahman. That Bhagavan, that Brahma Param Brahman has a desire to enjoy. So, it becomes many different beings. That's actually what's literally stated in the Upanishads. It's not a mistake or an illusion. It's intentional. And there are some 
there are some uh then how does that explain maya it's just that there are some ex, there are some expansions of bhagavan that don't cooperate with the intrinsic setup of reality so they have an alternate reality make sense it's so it's actually the difficult thing about all this stuff is that even the philosophies that are not right are not really totally off they're pretty close to right so this is the little thing that just makes a, a big difference is that the, the monists are saying every, all this multiplicity is a mistake and an illusion and it, 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 actually everything is one but all this multiplicity is a mistake and illusion what the Bhagavatam is saying is actually everything is one and all the multiplicity is intentional and not an illusion it's real and intentional and it has a purpose the one being is manifest in multiplicity multiplicitous ways on purpose so this also solves your logical problems of how can that happen Brahman can't be conquered or, or broken right the only way that Brahman can be multiplied or split or divided is if Brahman wants to okay so that was the answer to number five no more question so it seems like everybody's okay with that then we can go and take see what we're going to do today 98 percent okay um what we're going to look at today is bhakti so we looked at we looked at maya we looked at jiva now we're going to look at bhakti and just like we're trying to put all these things in relation to each other so we're going to talk about bhakti in relation to the jiva and also bhakti in relation to bhagavan so that's going to leave just for class 10 we have to talk about bhagavan which will be fun an interesting thing actually this is the most interesting thing just to get a little personal with you for a second when I was in college for the short amount of time that I was in college I wanted to see what it would be like to major in philosophy first I wanted to see what it would be like to ma major in music and I was very disappointed with that um, then I wanted to see what it would be like to major in philosophy and I was a bit disappointed with that and then I tried to see what it would be like to major in psychology and then I was just like forget it but anyway, while I was trying my philosophy courses, the thing that frustrated the, me the most is that it, every philosophy that they would talk about would, sounded really great. So it would frustrate me to just move on to the next one and not like talk about how do you put this particular philosophy into practice. Um, so that's the very interesting difference between Western approach to philosophy and Vedic approach to philosophy, though actually the whole first three chapters of Bhagavad Gita is really just almost only about this point. Is that what's the point, what's the use of philosophy if it's not put into action? So remember that Vedic schools of philosophy are always going to be directly paired with their practice. And how they're put into action because you don't just sit around and talk about philosophy but you actually act on it so if you you know try to go try to subscribe to the radical monist school you'll wind up doing certain kind of practices living your life a certain kind of way the practices will be focused on a lot of study and meditation so it'll be a lot of intellectual work which is not to say that this is absent from any any spiritual practice there's always a strong component of intellectual work but it's the it's the centerpiece of the Advaita practice is the intellectual work of rooting out ignorances from the logic circuits in your mind so that's what that's what Advaita Vadi school looks like. It looks like a bunch of people 
really separating themselves from the society that they feel uh, embodies the lies that they want to remove themselves from and really just trying to not perform activity and action, trying to not act like an individual subject because they want to become Brahman. So it's just a lot of meditation on oneness or something and a lot of study. Because that's what they're trying to do, remove the ignorance of the fact that you're Brahman. So that will work. These cures will work. You can realize that you are Brahman like that. But the deeper cause of the Jiva's situation, it's not just that it doesn't know that it's Brahman. It's also that it doesn't know that Brahman has personality, that it has color, shapes, forms, names, etc. And that it, there's... It has a function. The, the individual has a function in relation to Brahma. So Vyas didn't see exactly that just ignorance. Uh, our problems result from ignorance of Brahma. It's ignorance of Bhagavan. So, it, you know, it's not like it's a different vision. It's not that Brahma, Paramatma, and Bhagavan are different things. So it's not that the Bhagavatam vision is different from the Advaitavadi vision, it's just more detailed. Oh, I think this is out of order. I think I wanted the next point that should come up with, let me just pop them all up on the screen. Here you go. He sees the cure as bhakti, the agency which connects entities. So that the cure, Advaitavadis, their cure is, is mostly jnanam. It's called jnanam, which means working on your perception or your working on your intellect. For Vyasa's point of view or for the Bhagavad's point of view, the cure is bhakti. Because bhakti is the agency which forms relationships between entities. And so he calls he no, he calls the object of bhakti a dokshaja, which means, as I, we talked about this before, sensual experience or akshaja, the stuff that is produced from the senses, akshaja, the stuff that comes from your eyes, literally, pales or is pushed down by this being called a dokshaja. So, in other words, the attractiveness of maya becomes becomes small becomes unnoticeable in comparison to the attractiveness of bhagavan so if the jiva can just get some aksha or eyes on bhagavan then their their infatuation with maya will be cured so what vyasa sees is that the living entity doesn't necessarily just need to study things but the living entity needs to comprehend Bhagavan to living entity the jiva me and you need to be able to experience Bhagavan so whatever work we need to do which will include some of the work that looks like the Advaita Vadi's work some of the meditation some of the study some of the intellectual digestion some of the karmas you know which mean like some of the good activities the, that work is to lessen and weaken and eventually remove the impediments that prevent us from experiencing Bhagavan. But it's actually the experience of Bhagavan which is what saves the jiva from its un misfortune, from its problem. So, bhakti is called the yoga, and yoga means to connect things. Even without the word yoga, the word bhakti itself is based on the root bhaj, and bhaj means to share. So, in other words, bhaj means when two 
or more entities participate in one thing. Like if a child shares her toys with somebody else, then there's two kids playing with one toy. So that's called budge. Or if you sit down and eat with somebody else, you're partaking in one meal. Um, even like frying things in one pot or putting things in one, like dipping uh, peppers in one batter and frying them. Bhaji. Or there may be snacks that people like to enjoy together. They could get the nickname Bhaj, Bhaji. But the, the root here, Bhaj, means to share, which doesn't just mean like, it doesn't mean like in Japanese, wak, Waka means to share also. But Waka is like a divisive sharing where you split something up and spread it out with people. Bhaj is the opposite point of view on sharing. It's not like you're taking the subject, like if you share a pizza by slicing it into a million pieces, and giving it to a million people. That's like the Japanese concept of sharing. The Indian concept of sharing with this word budge is different. It's like you bring a thousand people here to eat this pizza. So it's bringing the subjects into one experience. Is what That's what we mean by the word share. That's what the budge word means. And that's the root of the word bhakti. So then why does it mean love? get it that's why it means love because that's love is the gravity force actually oh god is gravity but there's just so many different kinds of gravity there's a physical gravity but there's all kinds of other gravity that's why it's called krishna krishna literally has a meaning that basically means gravity but love is the gravitational it's the ultimate gravitational force because it, it doesn't act on physical mass but it acts on conscious soul it's a gravity of soul so love is the gravity that pulls the soul to contact another soul. And that's why it's called bhakti. Which, so it's going to pull these two souls together into one experience. <laughs>